uh, another unique apologist in our midst, and that's Dr. Phil Fernandez. And he's got a, um, a different style about him as well, and we appreciate that. We appreciate some of the topics he's covered here in the past. And uh, this evening, we have a, a topic called cultural Marxism. And you might say, Marxism? That's dead, isn't it? Look at what happened to the Soviet Union. Look what happened to Cuba, Venezuela. That's dead. But do you be surprised what we have even in our country? And uh, Phil is going to tell us a lot about that. Phil is the, uh, uh, the president of the Institute of Biblical Defense. He's also a pastor. And he also teaches, uh, I think, still at two Christian schools, right? So he's uh, full-time in all those uh, wearing different hats. So Phil, come on up and share with us. Thank you. Thank you, Heinz. Let's, uh, let's go to the Lord with a quick word of prayer. Father, in Jesus' precious name, I just pray, Lord, that uh, you would uh, anoint me to proclaim your truth so that I would not lead anyone astray. And uh, you call preachers of the word to not only exhort others in sound doctrine, but also to refute those who contradict. And so I pray, Lord, that we would not only know your truth, but we would be able to apply your truth and refute the lies that our culture has. And I pray, Lord, that you just open hearts and minds uh, to receive the truths that are going to be proclaimed today. And, um, and I just pray, Lord, that we would cling to you and your word and apply the truths of your word to our lives so that we could become closer to your son, Jesus, each and every day. In Jesus' precious name we pray, amen. I want to start out by reading a couple uh, passages. And one is Isaiah chapter 5, verses 20 and 21. And that reads, Woe to those who call evil good and good evil who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Woe to those who are wise in their own eyes and prudent in their own sight. And today we have many leaders that are out there that proclaim to be wise, uh, but they call evil good and good evil. Romans chapter 1, Paul, after talking about how people suppress the truth, that God has revealed to us about himself in creation. He closes Romans 1 with verse 32, talking about these people who have rejected God, who profess to be wise but become fools. In verse 32 of Romans 1, he's, Paul says, who knowing the righteous judgment of God, that those who practice such things are deserving of death, not only do the same, but also approve of those who practice them. And that's what we're going to be talking about today is people, a growing movement within our culture of people who call evil good and they call good evil. All of a sudden, we Christians are being viewed as, as the bad guys. And, um, and a culture that approves sinful lifestyles but looks down upon uh, traditional biblical Christian lifestyles. And so I titled tonight's lecture, Postmodernism, Cultural Marxism, and the Death of the Individual. Postmodernism, Cultural Marxism, and the Death of the Individual. Now, before we could even talk about postmodernism, we need to look back at modernism and then pre-modern times. And so that's what we'll do. So it's kind of a history of Western culture and its thought, Western civilization and its thought. And in pre-modern times, uh, it was thought that truth is absolute, something that Heinz touched on a little earlier when he was talking about the late apologist uh, Ravi Zacharias. Truth is absolute, and it corresponds to reality, okay? Um, you know, in pre-modern times, uh, the guys like Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle, they believed in absolute truth, and they believe that truth is knowable. They believe that human reason works. And this was a good fit for the Christian worldview as Christianity went 
uh, over the course of several hundred years, and it became the dominant uh, religion uh, of uh, Western civilization. But in pre-modern times, now before pre-modern times, you had the Greek and Roman myths. But then you had philosophers refuting the myths, the ancient myths, and uh, they believed that truth is absolute, it corresponds to reality, and that truth is knowable. They believed that the universe makes sense. So we could study the universe and try to find out um, about the world in which we live. Uh, but they also believed in a reality beyond the five senses. So even Aristotle and Plato would, would talk about values such, such as goodness and beauty and, and truth, things that go beyond the five senses. Now, this was a good fit for the Christian worldview because uh, the Christian worldview taught that we were created by a rational God. And this rational God created us in his image so that through human reason, we could make sense out of the world in which we live because God made a world that makes sense, a world with natural laws and things that operate in such a way that we could find out uh, about truth. So that's why modern science was founded by Bible-believing Christians. Even though the ancient Greek philosophers, the ones at least who won the debates, the, the Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle's, even though they believed in universal truth and man's ability to know it and believed in doing science, there was always in the back of their minds, well, how do we know that our reason is really telling us the truth? Well, with the Christian worldview and the belief in the rational God who created the universe, all of a sudden human re reason made sense because we were created in God's image. It's kind of like C.S. Lewis's argument that if we're going to trust in the validity of reason with a small r, human reason, then we have to believe it has a rational cause. So there's no basis for trusting reason with a small r unless reason exists with a capital R, i.e. the rational God. So we got this tremendous confidence, uh, Christian thinkers and Christians who started modern science, tremendous confidence that man could really find out about truth, about the world in which we live. Uh, unfortunately, we got overconfident. And we fell so much in love with the gift, human reason, that we began to forget about the gift giver, the rational God. And so Rene Descartes was a professing Christian. He lived from 1596 to 1650. And he got so confident in human reason, he was writing papers on geometry and was a mathematician and a scientist. He got so confident in human reason that he tried to prove everything through reason alone. The way he did this was he said, I'm not going to believe in anything unless I know it with certainty. And then if I find that point of certainty, I'm going to deduce all truth from that point of certainty. And so he began to doubt everything. Well, the more he doubted, the more he acknowledged the existence of himself, the doubter. Doubting is a form of thinking, so he said, I think, therefore I am. And he tried to prove um, God's existence in all truth through uh, human reason alone. And that's Rene, there's a photo of Rene Descartes, good looking French guy. Uh, and so this is what led to modernism. Uh, he meant it, you know, he, uh, Rene Descartes, meant his philosophical system to be an argument for Christianity, but it ended up imploding on him. And it led to modernism, the attempt to find all truth and solve all our problems through unaided human reason, through human reason alone. Well, Blaise Pascal, another French, another good-looking French philosopher, I'll show you his, his mug right there, kind of looks like a, a pinky with long hair. And, uh, but Blaise, Blaise Pascal, his response to Rene Descartes, they were contemporaries of each other, and he, he said, uh, well, if, if we could find all truth and solve all our problems through human reason alone, then we don't need revelation from God. And so what he was doing was he was predicting 
that Rene Descartes modernist project was going to backfire and uh, become not an argument for God, but an argument against God. So there's Blaise Pascal. And so what you had was Christianity had become the dominant worldview of Western civilization from about 380 AD, the time of St. Augustine, until about the, the 1700s. But with the start of modernism and enlightenment rationalism, where we began to deify reason and uh, act like reason was the most important thing, this led to deism, the belief that God created the universe, but then he leaves it alone and no longer performs miracles. So we started finding out that, oh, we thought the gods did this and the gods did that. Now we found out that there's natural explanations for a lot of these things. Well, we got so much confidence, got overconfident in human reason, that we thought that eventually we would find a natural cause for everything. And so we thought, okay, well, then the, the biblical authors, they were pre-scientific, and they just didn't realize what they thought they were seeing was miracles, but miracles don't happen. And so you had guys like Benedict Spinoza, and then later on David Hume, arguing against miracles. And so he went from Christianity, a God who performs miracles, to deism. Among the leaders of Western civilization, deism became the most dominant worldview, where God doesn't perform miracles. Well, you got an irrelevant God, then, if he can't intervene and perform miracles. So eventually, you know, what's the difference between... What's, there's no practical difference between an irrelevant God and no God at all. So that led to naturalism, the idea that only nature exists, that there is no God, there are no supernatural beings, there are no supernatural events, no miracles. Well, the problem with naturalism, when that became dominant in Western civilization, is if there is no God, then there's no truth, there's no morality, there's no meaning, and there's no value to human life. This is what's called nihilism, nothingism. Okay? But most people couldn't stay in that nihilistic stage. So the leaders of Western civilization, most of them couldn't stay there. So it's kind of like, oh, look, okay, there's no God, so there's no truth, no meaning, no morality, no value to our lives. But we desperately need those things. Let's just create it through an act of the will. And that's what existentialism is, where uh, now you have, you know, modernism started out with the rational individual finding truth and solving all his problems through reason alone. The modernist project failed so miserably that at the end of modernism, the final stage, you still have the individual, but reason is gone. Now it's the non-rational individual through a leap of blind faith, actualizes himself and creates his own meaning, his own truth, his own reality. Um, so you'll end up with, uh, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about Jean-Paul Sartre, the French existentialist, in a little bit. But at this point, human reason is gone. And, um, and so basically what I'm saying is nihilism is a logical consequence of naturalism or atheism and it leaves man without hope. So many atheists could not be consistent atheists, so they tried to create hope through existentialism, through Marxism. Marx tried to give meaning to life by seeing everything through uh, economic terms. We'll talk a little bit about Marxism and how it's given way to cultural Marxism. But there's Jean-Paul Sartre, the French existentialist. You know, there's two ways to to uh, appear to be smart. One is to do, to, to do it like Heinz, do a lot of studying, a lot of reading, a lot of hard work, okay? And then you can get pretty smart and people will respect you. Another way is just get to uh, smoke a pipe. And so you get a lot of guys that really look like smart guys just because they put a pipe in their mouth. And Jean-Paul Sartre was a lot like that. And he was intelligent, but he used his intelligence against the truth, against God. And uh, so for existentialism and Jean-Paul Jean Sartre, 
Uh, there's no God, no truth, no morality, no meaning. So man is free to create his own truth, morality, and meaning. See, before this, we believe that God created us so human beings had certain freedoms but also certain boundaries. We came into existence with a defined nature, a fallen nature at that, uh, but Jesus came to save us. Um, well, what the existentialists are saying, no, we come into life as a blank check, and you get to fill in the blanks, okay? You get to, there is no God who created you, so you get to create yourself. And that's what the existentialists like Sartre would say. Then, but you would also have nihilists like Friedrich Nietzsche, the great German atheist philosopher. Friedrich Nietzsche said, well, if God is dead, and he believed God was dead, that basically our belief in God, we eventually advanced through modernism and rationalism and science, and we disproved God, he believed. And so he said, well, if God is dead, then truth is dead, morality is dead, meaning is dead. But he believed this would lead to the superman, the overman, um, a group of uh, humans who, through their courage and their will to power, because if there's no, no reason or truth anymore, all that's left is power and a man's will, through their will to power, they would create their own new truth, new morality, new meaning. Nietzsche rejected the, what he called the soft values of Christianity and promoted the hard values of the overman. So forget about grace and mercy. Forget about traditional sexual morality. Uh, we need to experiment and step uh, outside of that. And so Nietzsche was nihilistic right down to the point where instead of what he should have realized was if God is dead and truth is dead, morality is dead, meaning is dead, then man is dead too. But even Friedrich Nietzsche, who I believe was probably the most consistent atheist who ever lived, he couldn't be consistent with it. And so he thought that this would lead to the Superman, and uh, I think he was mistaken on that. Now, the Christian response to Nietzsche and his thought, C.S. Lewis, in his work, The Abolition of Man, by us rejecting God's moral laws. C.S. Lewis wrote The Abolition of Man in the 1940s when he saw textbooks for uh, elementary school students teaching there's no such thing as right and wrong. Lewis said this is going to lead to a group of, it's going to lead to men without chest, men without moral consciences, men who no longer could determine what's right and what's wrong. And um, C.S. Lewis argued that laws and science would no longer find truth or defend truth. They would just be used as a means uh, for those in power to stay in power and oppress the masses. And so if you get a chance to read, read your newspaper, see what's going on in the world today, and then read The Abolition of Man, and you tell me whether or not C.S. Lewis got it right. Francis Schaeffer, his work... Um, uh, back to freedom and human dignity, he referred to the death of man. And so the Christian thinkers understood, if we want to throw God out of our society, you know, Nietzsche was consistent enough to know, look, his atheist friends said, God is dead and they want, let's party. Nietzsche said, no, if God is dead, then so is truth, morality, and meaning. Nietzsche tells his buddies, don't party, freak out. When we threw God off the bridge, we had no right to go through his pockets and say, oh, morality, we need that. Oh, truth, got to have that. Oh, meaning, got to have that. Oh, value to human life. Okay, now let's throw God off the bridge. Nietzsche said when we threw God off the bridge, everything goes off the bridge with him. But then Nietzsche was calling on man through his will to power to create his own new values. Well, Francis Schaeffer, like C.S. Lewis before him, realized that if God is dead, man is dead too. So you want to keep God out of the equation, the death of man is the, the final uh, destination. And that's why I titled this Postmodernism, Cultural Marxism, and the Death of the Individual. And we're going to see when you watch the news and you think everything's insane, 
there was some thinking behind that insanity. But I think that's the choices we have. Either God, submit to God, or eventually insanity and the death of man, the death of the individual. So postmodernism was a reaction against modernism. Modernism failed to find absolute truth and failed to solve man's problems. I mean, we could find a cure for diseases, but we also can figure out different ways to blow the planet up, okay? We couldn't solve poverty. We couldn't solve wars. You know, we always thought we're getting better, we, we're evolving. We even referred to World War I after it was over as the war to end all wars until World War II came. So modernism failed miserably. It failed to find absolute truth. It failed to solve man's problems. Once you say, I don't need revelation from God, I'm on my own, I can do this on my own, you're in a hurt locker, okay? And so modernism failed to find absolute truth, failed to solve man's problems. The modernist project was a dismal failure. And so that led to postmodernism. An example is Jacques Derrida, French uh, postmodernist. There he's smoking a pipe. So all you got to do to look, look smart. And, um, but a postmodernist rejects absolute truth. They say all we have are stories, narratives, and there is no meta narrative. There is no story above other stories to determine whether the story that you like is true or false. So it's the rejection of all meta narratives. Uh, the rejection of all worldviews. And uh, so postmodernism rejects absolute truth. It also uh, rejects human reason's ability to find truth. Truth is relative to one's community. It's not, the existentialist would say, the individual decides. In postmodernism, the individual is dead. So the community decides. Truth is relative to one's community and the individual only exists as part of the community. So the individual is dead. The individual is defined only by the community. Postmodernism focuses on beauty, mystery, and narrative stories, focuses on meaning, feelings, and the will. It gets away from reason, though. It denies absolute morality. Uh, then in postmodernism, there's a heavy emphasis on tolerance. They talk about tolerance all the time. But keep in mind, that's the new tolerance, not traditional tolerance. Traditional tolerance, you tolerated people that you disagreed with. The new tolerance is the belief that all beliefs are equally true, because there really is no absolute truth. So all beliefs are equally true. There's no such thing as right and wrong, so all behavior is equally wholesome. Oh, by the way, if you disagree with us, we can't tolerate you. So the new tolerance has become the most intolerant uh, worldview in mankind's history, all done in the name uh, of tolerance. The postmodernist rejects dichotomous thinking. That's what, what, what Heinz was talking about, the either or. Either this is true or this other thing is true. Either a statement is true or the statement is false. Either an action is right or an action is wrong. They say, no, no, we need to get away from dichotomous thinking. And then they reduce all authority to power. Authority means you've earned the right to be heard. You've earned the right to lead. But if you reduce all authority to power, it, means, it just means in the end that your will to power, you've displayed that in a stronger fashion than anybody else, and your community is going to rise to the top because of it. So it's all about power. It's like uh, J.P. Moreland, the Christian philosopher, said, once reason and truth are gone, all that's left is shouting. And so you look at the political debates today, you look at television, if somebody disagrees with the president, they just call them names. There's no longer any appeal to what is right and wrong or appeal to truth or falsehood, just, just resort to name calling because all authority has been reduced to power. So instead of rational arguments, you get power narratives. So when you watch the news, you turn on CNN or ABC or NBC, 
what you're getting are power, power narratives. This is the story that are like, we had a presidential candidate that not too long ago uh, said that we believe in truth, uh, not the facts. Okay? And people thought, okay, this guy made another dumb statement because he makes quite a few dumb statements. He's just, some people, they get up in front of a crowd and they say dumb things, and he's, he's like that. Uh, but on this particular statement, I don't think he made a mistake. I think that's his belief system. His belief system is we choose what story, what phony baloney story we want to be true. That becomes our truth. And we're never going to allow any amount of facts to discourage us from embracing our truth. So if you're part of the postmodern gay community, no matter how many facts that you show people to show that the gay lifestyle is very dangerous to a person's health, they're not going to allow facts to disturb uh, their narrative. If your narrative is the gun control narrative, then it doesn't matter if the facts show that you know, 97, 98% of mass shootings occur in gun-free zones. So maybe the problem is not the guns, Maybe the problem's not allowing people to exercise the right to bear arms. But it doesn't matter. The facts, we don't care about the facts. We have our own truth that we've chosen through our will and our community's narrative. Okay? And um, so power narratives instead of rational uh, arguments. Uh, by the way, if you, if you don't watch the news once and you don't see this and you think that Man, this Fernandez doesn't even, I don't even know what he's talking about. Just hang out on a non-Christian college campus. In fact, the sad thing is you can hang out on some Christian college campuses today and get this kind of stuff. Even the uh, schools in the Southern Baptist Convention, their professors are starting to embrace what is called critical race theory. And they're starting to read the scriptures through those lenses. And believe me, that distorts the gospel to where it's not good news any longer. It's a different gospel. Uh, but postmodernism, we create our own reality through language. So rather than language pointing back to truth, there is no truth. It's just all language. Okay? Uh, Nietzsche, the way he put it, he said, truth is metaphor. Usually a metaphor is symbolic of some truth. He's saying, no, behind the metaphor, you get another metaphor. Okay? Then they deconstruct text. They believe that a text, like the Bible, that the reader has as much right to determine the meaning as the author did. And so you can twist the text to say whatever you want it to say. So in certain postmodern circles, to the gay community, Jesus becomes a gay activist or a gay man himself. To the radical feminist movement, Jesus came to earth to fight for women's rights. To the liberal theologians, uh, liberation theologians, Jesus becomes the greatest Marxist revolutionary who ever lived, who came to set the poor free through revolution. Um, and so you get to basically just deconstruct the text and make it say whatever you want it to say, because there is no real objective history. So uh, among uh, black Christologists, which is very popular in uh, critical race theory. By, by the way, most, most black preachers that I've met still preach the true gospel and believe the Bible is the word of God. But black Christology uh, is a view that Jesus came to fight for the rights of minorities, and that's what the whole Bible is about, is deliverance of minorities from the uh, oppressors. And... Um, and so that's all the deconstruction of text. Now, now Jacques Derrida, the postmodernist that we mentioned earlier, he's big, on, big time into this. So I, I believe it, is, it was him. He wrote an article. And so another scholar responded by trying to refute the article, but he totally misrepresented what Jacques Derrida wrote and argued. And uh, so Derrida responded, said, no, you totally misunderstood me. 
I meant something totally different. Well, the guy responded to Derrida by saying, hey, the reader has as much right to the meaning of the text as the author. In other words, he refuted Derrida by showing, I can take your statements and make them mean whatever I want them to mean, and based on your worldview, you have no right to contest that. And, uh, and then postmodernism, one of its children is political correctness. The idea, since we don't arrive at our political views through reason and argumentation and facts, we just choose what we want to believe, then you just name call anybody who disagrees with you. So if people are saying, well, I think unborn babies have the right to life, they just respond by saying, oh, you're anti-woman. You're against women's rights. And we have all these politically correct uh, mantras. If you believe homosexuality is a, a sin, you're homophobic, okay? And, uh, and that's political correctness, where there will be no debate, there will just be name calling, all a product of postmodernism. Now, we don't have time to refute postmodernism, but it, it, it's just, it refutes itself. To say there is no absolute truth, you're making a truth claim. If there's no absolute truth, that would be a truth. So the statement, there is no absolute truth, has to be false. Okay? Uh, to say that, it's, it's, that uh, there's no such thing as right and wrong, okay, uh, what they're basically saying is that it's wrong to call any actions wrong. Okay? So they'll say it's wrong for you Christians to want your morality taught in the public schools because there's no such thing as right and wrong. Well, wait a minute, if there's no such thing as right and wrong, Christians are never wrong. Leave us alone. But they shoot themselves in the foot. They make, they're human, so they make moral value judgments, telling others you're not supposed to make moral value judgments. So they reject moral absolutes while creating new moral absolutes. So if you're a Christian, you're an intolerant bigot, but if you're uh, a homosexual, that's a healthy lifestyle, okay? Um, and, um, and then even their language, if, if language, that should be, word should be reality there. If language never touches reality, then neither does their language. So when they proclaim postmodernism, they're not telling us anything about reality, so their view should be dismissed. And they say there's no meta narrative, but postmodernism itself has become the meta narrative through which they judge all other narratives. So it's self refuting from beginning to end, it's complete uh, nonsense. So, and then it fails to give any reason to be postmodern. Now, postmodernists, if you're here today, might say, no, there's lots of good reasons to be postmodern. Excuse me, you've thrown reason out. So if you've already condemned reason to the garbage bin of history, then you can't consistently present any reasons why anybody else should be postmodern. So it's, it's, it's like saying there's no place for logical argumentation and then trying to give a logical argument for that view, okay? And then while proclaiming tolerance, the postmodernist cannot tolerate any non-postmodernist. Now, going back to modernism, kind of on the, uh, uh, and I have to go back here to talk a little bit about Karl Marx, whose views were pretty modernistic, but to introduce his views to show how cultural Marxism, which is very postmodern, how it took Marx's views and transformed them. But Marx held to what's called dialectical materialism. He, his dialectic, he saw, you know, there'd be a truth, others would argue with that truth, and then a new truth would be synthesized so he saw truth and history as unfolding, okay? So there's no absolute truth, but truth is unfolding, uh, evolving throughout history. Uh, but Hegel viewed that his dialectic was in the realm of ideas. Marx was a materialist. He believed only matter exists. He was an atheist who believed only matter exists. So he took the dialectic and applied it to materialism. He also believed that all reality was determined, but it's economically determined. 
So he viewed, instead of things like sin and salvation, he viewed like the, the workers, he viewed profit um, as evil, and he believed that the workers, there's class struggle between the workers and the business owners, and that the workers should revolt against the business owners. He believed we should abolish private property, we should abolish the family and abolish religion. He viewed religion as the opium of the people, the drug that kept the working class from revolting against the business owners because they believe if I'm a good little worker who gets abused by his boss, then I'll get rewards in heaven. Marx said, man, that's opium, that's a drug. Um, we need to uh, abolish uh, religion. And, and uh, by the way, anything that gets in the way of Marx, Marx's goals, he wanted abolished, and the family would be included there. He wanted free government education for all children. You know, we've got that in America today. The Founding Fathers didn't. The Founding Fathers believed the churches, the local communities, the families, the parents, they should educate the children. You don't want big government coming in. Because when big government comes in, it will be indoctrination and political correctness. There will be no true education. They won't think about what's best for the children. They'll think about what's best for people in positions of power, like C.S. Lewis said in The Abolition of Man. He wanted a progressive and graduated income tax to redistribute the wealth and a national bank. These are all things we have now. And these are Marxist ideas. Well, how did cultural Marxism, which is more postmodern than modern, um, how did cult mo cultural Marxism come into existence? And I think cultural Marxism is the biggest rival to the Christian worldview today. Well, before World War I, Marxists believed, economic Marxists, traditional Marxists believed that if war started in Europe, the working class would refuse to side with their governments and would use that, use the chaos to revolt against the business owners. Instead, in World War I, the working class put on their uniforms and went to war for their countries. They didn't revolt. And this was something that these self-proclaimed geniuses, they, they thought, this is automatic, man. When war breaks out in Europe, and everybody knew war was going to break out in Europe, when it breaks out in Europe, World War I, the workers are not going to fight for their countries. They're going to have revolution against the business owners. So after World War I, Marxists tried to figure out why the working class uh, did not revolt. Okay? And so you had like a German like Antonio Gramsci, um, you also had another uh, Marxist named George Lukacs. Uh, they believed that Western democracy and capitalism, free enterprise, where you get to benefit from your own labor, that Western democracy and capitalism would have to be destroyed before the revolution. So this is really weird. The, these are Marxists who are recognizing that the workers in Europe and America have it so good they'll never revolt. So we got to make life miserable for the workers in order for them to want to revolt. Well, wait a minute. If we've got it so good, maybe we ought to just keep it that way. Okay? Let me tell you this. This, this virus crisis seems to be a real crisis. It seems that something seeped out of a Wuhan laboratory and spread throughout this world. But there are a lot of cultural Marxists in political, powerful political places today that would love to see the shutdown continue because people aren't going to side with them if their businesses are prospering. Okay? So a cultural Marxist would want the economy to crumble so that people then might uh, become insane enough to accept their ideas. And, um, and so, uh, but Gramsci and Lukacs believed that Western democracy, Western freedom, 
You know, we're a constitutional republic over here, or at least we used to be. But Western democracy and capitalism would have to be destroyed before the revolution. There's a picture of Antonio Gramsci, the Italian. I'm half Italian. Now you know where I got my good looks from. And, um, but Gramsci believed religion was too strong in the West. He, he, say, he, said, he was basically saying to Karl Marx, you're right, religion is the opium of the people, but it's such good opium that the people are, are not going to give up on religion on their own. And it's the opium that kept the workers from revolting. And so Gramsci said, we can't do this through revolution. We need to overthrow the West through evolution, through gradual change. Gramsci, Antonio Gramsci called, he said that Western civilization had to be transformed by infiltrating religion, the media, education, and politics, and take it over from within. Okay? So in the 1960s and 1970s, we started having cultural Marxists getting professorships on college campuses, and now we're suffering from that 50 years later. They're transforming a culture. And um, uh, now he was an Italian Marxist, he was imprisoned by Mussolini, the fascist, and died in prison in 1937. Uh, the Frankfurt School. George uh, Lukacs uh, tried to attack the family unit and Christian morality. He promoted sexual immorality to destroy society in Hungary, and he referred to this as cultural terrorism. So a lot of these guys, they don't believe in right and wrong. So they believe, look, we want to destroy, if we want to rebuild Western civilization in our own image, we've got to destroy it first, okay? And um, this is why I give my lecture, The Coming Death of Western Civilization. These people hate Western civilization. Why do they hate Western civilization? They hate Western civilization because it was so influenced by Christianity, and they hate Christianity because they hate Christianity's God, okay? And um, I, I'm, you know, it really bothers me. Sometimes Fox News will get some things right, but it really bothers me that they always act like the other side, the cultural Marxist side, is stupid. And that if we could just show them that their ideas will destroy the economy, will destroy people's lives, will destroy Western civilization, if we could just convince them of that, then they'll join us and join traditional Christian views. No, these people aren't stupid. They know that their ideas will destroy Western civilization, but that's been their goal all along. They want to destroy Western civilization, uh, even if it means destroying jobs and destroying lives, uh, because they think that their totalitarian ideas, that's what they want to proclaim. And so we have to understand the other side, um, they're not stupid, and they don't believe in right and wrong, so they're willing to do evil things and to proclaim lies if that's what it means to bring about their goals. The communists would say the ends justifies the means. So uh, Luk Lukács uh, promoting sexual immorality, we got that in... in in this state now, we got this referendum to try to shut down the government teaching transgender studies to kindergartners. Okay? Uh, so these fly-by-night guys, don't laugh at them. They, they've won. At this particular point, they've won the culture war. We've got to try to take back. You know, that's, that's the reason why our president right now, President Trump, is so hated uh, by the Democratic Party, but also by the establishment in the Republican Party because he's a nationalist, he's pro-America, he's not an internationalist, he's not a cultural Marxist, um, and he doesn't want to throw away America. We've got to reach the point where we've got to understand that a lot of our leaders hate America and are trying to sell America out. Um, they want a piece of the global pie, they want internationalism, they want global government. And if we keep putting our heads in the sand and denying that, 
we're going to continue to lose this culture war. There's a picture of George Lukacs. Um, and so he encouraged presenting sexually explicit material to children in education. His views were rejected, and he had to flee from Hungary. Good for Hungary. That was a long time ago, but his views have been spread to America and are spreading like wildfire. They dominate the schools today. In 1923, Lukacs went to Frankfurt, Germany, to meet with other cultural Marxists, um, and they started the Frankfurt School. See, what they're saying is that you're just not going to get this economic revolution, and so we've got to change society from within. So fellow Marxist uh, Felix Wheel um, financed the new Marxist think tank, and in 1930, Max Horkheimer... Uh, combined the psychological thought of Sigmund Freud, the atheist Sigmund Freud, he can combine the psychological thought with, of Sigmund Freud with Marxism. Now it's not just the workers that are oppressed. Now everyone, not just the workers, everyone is psychologically oppressed by Western leaders and anybody uh, who holds to traditional Western Christian views. When the Nazis took control in Germany in 1933, the, the Marxists there, many of them were Jews, so they were 0 for 2. They were Marxist, not National Socialists. Uh, a Marxist is just basically an international socialist, and uh, uh, the Nazis were National Socialists, okay? And, um, and so they had to flee because the Nazis were anti-Jewish, anti-Semitic, uh, but also they were opposed to the Marxist, the communist, and so they had to flee. Well, where did they go? They went to New York City, and the Frankfurt School took residence in Columbia University, the number one university for uh, training educators. And so this was in the 1930s. They developed critical theory, the Frankfurt School, now, based out of uh, Columbia University, they developed critical theory, and this view criticized every pillar of Western society, the family, uh, democracy, or a constitutional republic, Christianity, freedom of speech, traditional morality, capitalism. They tried to criticize every pillar of Western civilization because it's their goal to bring down Western civilization. We have some of our most powerful politicians want to bring down Western civilization and hold to critical theory. There's a picture of the Frankfurt School there. Uh, Theodore Adorno authored The Authoritarian Personality. He condemned traditional American views about gender roles, male and female, and American views of human sexuality. He condemned them as prejudice. He labeled these views fascist. So these guys, their views are very fascist. They're, you know, fascism and socialism and communism, big government control. Well, these guys ended up changing the definition of words in an Orwellian way so that now if you disagree with them, you're, you're a fascist. It's like Antifa. They're supposed to be anti-fascist, but they're fascist. And they don't even know it. And they're just opposed to anyone who holds the traditional uh, morality. Well, Adorno condemned American views about gender. Now with transgenderism, and uh, I don't know how many, we've got like hundreds of different genders now, according to these uh, uh, critical theorists. Uh, he shifted away, cultural Marxism shifted away from economic oppression, the business owners versus the workers. I don't know about you, but the guy who signs my paycheck He's my friend, okay? I like having a job. These guys, the guy who signs your paycheck is evil, but they shifted away from mere economic oppression to psychological oppression. And now America is a divide and conquer strategy. America is divided into two groups, the oppressors and the oppressed. And the oppressors uh, are male of European descent, okay? So, you know, it used to be, I wasn't, I'm, I'll let you know, I wasn't always a white guy. Being half Italian and half Portuguese, 
I was not a white Anglo-Saxon, and being raised Roman Catholic, I wasn't a white Anglo-Saxon Protestant. So the racists that were out there, like Ku Klux Klan and all, didn't consider me a white guy. But as time went on, so many darker-skinned Europeans embraced the American dream, embraced, embraced traditional Christian ideas, so that now all males of European descent um, have white privilege. Okay, you don't have to be real. I was born to Portuguese immigrants and Italian immigrants, and uh, my only ticket out of Jersey, unless I wanted to mop floors for the rest of my life, was to join the United States Marine Corps. So much for white privilege. I had to pay my own tuition, okay? But they just, they want to make all males of European descent, you're the bad guys, and every, you're the oppressors. Gender and social, social roles of men and women were defined by the oppressors. So if, if, if you're called male or female, you're not really male or female. That's the oppressors forcing that on you. You get to be whatever gender you want to be. You get to make up your own gender if you want. And so gender distinctions don't really exist. They are simply a social construct forced on us by the oppressors. Uh, Herbert Mar Marcusa from the Frankfurt School, he wrote eros, uh, the Greek word for sensual love, eros and civilization in 1955. He promoted sexual freedom outside of traditional Christian morality. Traditional Christian morality, God made human sexuality for one man and one woman for one lifetime. Uh, he promoted sexual freedom outside of that. Uh, his book had a great influence on the sexual revolution of the 1960s. He identified the oppressed class as minorities, females, so now you take half of America and you say, yeah, you're oppressed too, minorities, women, and homosexuals. Uh, this led to many of the protests of the 1960s, the Black Power and Black Panther movement, radical feminism of the 1960s, the gay rights movement, and sexual liberation movement. He defined liberating tolerance as tolerance of any views from the extreme left. That's, you know, cultural Marxism. But liberating tolerance rejects any traditional views. So this is political correctness and intolerance of any traditional Christian views. And then Saul Alinsky, he was a devoted disciple of cultural Marxism. His Rules for Radicals was a practical guide for community organizers to promote his views. By the way, um, Hillary Clinton, Hillary Rodham Clinton, I think her bachelor's thesis um, was on Saul Alinsky's work, Rules for Radicals. And the only known picture of President Obama actually teaching giving a lecture, and he, you know, there were probably other pictures taken, but the only one we know of, he's, he's on the, writing on the board, a diagram from Saul Alinsky's Rules for Radicals. And he himself, President Obama, was started out as a community organizer, okay? He organized like riots and things of that sort. And, uh, but Saul Alinsky has influenced the thought of many powerful politicians today. And he wrote his book, Rules for Radicals. By the way, a lot of their techniques, like if you disagree with somebody, find dirt and their skeletons in their closet. You can't find skeletons in their closet, make stuff up. So what we saw against Clarence Thomas when he was nominated for the Supreme Court, what we saw against Justice Bork, and then eventually against uh, Ka Justice Kavanaugh that's following rules for radicals, okay? Uh, th that's why you don't debate President Trump, you call him a racist, you just call him names. Uh, so cultural Marxism has a hatred for, for traditional Christian values. They have a divide and conquer strategy, the oppressors versus the oppressed. Um, they produce tribalism. Everybody gets in, in their own little, little tribe, whether it's the pro-abortion tribe or the uh, Marxist tribe, whatever it may be. They attack the family unit 
and attempt to overthrow society through their views. People are not judged by their individual character. So if you're a, a white European Christian male, if you're white heterosexual Christian male, you're an oppressor. It doesn't matter. It's called systemic racism. You can't help it. You just are racist. Okay? So no matter how nice you are, you need to admit you're a racist and then move on. Okay? And, um, and so, so people are not, no longer judged by their individual character. This is what I mean by the death of man or the death of the individual or what C.S. Lewis called the abolition of man. This is coming down right now. People are not judged by their individual character. They're judged by the group that they're in, the group that they identify with. Um, they're either oppressors or the oppressed. This is critical race theory comes out of this. And, um, and what happens is that the individual dies. With critical race theory, the oppressors versus the oppressed is systemic racism. Um, it doesn't matter what your views are as an individual, how you treat people, what your character is. It's systemic. So if you're a white, male, Christian, heterosexual, you're automatically the oppressor. Okay? You're automatically a racist. Intersectionality, if you're white, male, Christian, and heterosexual, those oppressor groups intersect in you, so you're a four times loser. If you're like gay, a minority, um, you know, you, you basically gain powers by intersecting your different groups. So when, when Jesse Smollett made false claims about being beat up by white racists in uh, Chicago, uh, he, get, he gets a pass by the media because of his intersectionality. He's a minority and he's gay, okay? Um, but when someone who's in the oppressor groups, intersectionality demands that he be declared uh, a racist no matter well, what his views are and what he stands up for. Um, and here's the Christian response. I'll cover this real quickly here. The Christian response is that, like Dietrich von Hildebrand was a Catholic philosopher who opposed Adolf Hitler, had to flee Germany, went to Austria, then the Germans, then the Nazis took over, had to flee to Europe. When the Nazis took over Europe, he had to flee to America, and he taught philosophy at Fordham until his death. But a Roman Catholic philosopher, he argued that true community is only found in Christianity. That whenever you try to promote community, if you don't recognize the individual as being created in God's image and human life as being sacred, then you get collectivism, where the individual loses its value. The only value to an individual is what purpose they serve for the whole community. Okay? Individual rights are gone. The individual is dead. So true community is only found in the church the body of Christ. The world will know that we're Christ's disciples when we have love for one another. Okay? And, um, uh, but we were created, the Bible teaches in Genesis 1 and in Acts 17, we're all of the same race. There's only one hum human race. Uh, this idea of different human races, that's, that's an evolutionary falsehood. We're all created in God's image. Human life is sacred. And true community is only found in Christ. Godless systems like postmodernism, Marxist communism, cultural Marxism, national socialism of the Nazis, fascism, can never produce true community. They only produce collectivism, where it's only the group is important. And if for purposes to, to make the group flourish, if exterminating you is what's needed, so be it. Now, let me say this. You don't have to be Christian to agree with most of what I said today. Even many non-Christian thinkers today do not want to see Christian values eradicated from American society. 
people like the, the Jungian psychologist. He's not a Christian. He believes the Bible is a bunch of myths, but he believes those are the myths that have worked. So he doesn't want to see Christianity suppressed in America. Jordan Peterson. David Horowitz is a, uh, a former cultural Marxist who's a Jew Jewish agnostic who speaks against cultural Marxism. His latest book, The Dark Agenda, The Left's War Against Christianity, he dedicated that book to his Christian friends. So there are some people who aren't even Christians, and they're, they're rooting for Christians to win this culture war, because if we don't, they know that they're toast. Okay? Uh, Jordan Peterson argues against the new atheist. He says, your views are so close to Stalin's views, Stalin and Hitler and Lenin, what makes us think that your views are going to lead to anything but concentration camps and gulags? And uh, there's Jordan Peterson, David Horowitz. And, uh, but we even have, and I'll close with this, uh, there are even many black uh, thinkers who are opposed to critical race theory and cultural Marxism. The great economists, Thomas Sowell and Walter Williams, uh, the radio talk show host, Larry Elder, I think he's a brilliant man, Reverend Jesse Lee Peterson, the, the brilliant Candace Owens, Justice Clarence Thomas, um, and uh, who's the, the neurosurgeon? Um, ben Carson. Ben Carson, another brilliant guy. So this is not a white versus black thing. The cultural Marxists want us to think that uh, but the fact of the matter, this is freedom versus slavery. This is Christian truth uh, versus anti-Christian thought. Um, this is prosperity and health uh, against poverty and, um, and tyranny. And, um, and so basically, uh, what I'm saying, what is going on today when you watch the news, it's not just political. It's not just economic theory. Uh, it is religious there's a world, an anti-Christian worldview at the core called, called cultural Marxism, and right now they are winning the battles, and, um, and that is why there have been so many vicious attacks against our president, because he's saying enough is enough, America is worth fighting for. And if the cultural Marxists win the day, they have to break the back of America. Okay? Um, you know, I'll even go so far to say that I'm not pro-revolution in any way, shape, or form, but the founding fathers, Thomas Jefferson said, when the government fears the people, there is liberty. When the people fear the government, there is tyranny. And I would actually argue that an armed American middle class is the final roadblock uh, to global tyranny. But if the cultural Marxists uh, win the day, uh, America will collapse and that will usher in the death of Western civilization and uh, global uh, tyranny. So that's what I've got to say on the matter, and I think Think Heinz has some questions. Yeah, well, let, let's thank uh, Phil for this. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, we will take, a, I, I have a few questions, but if somebody else has a question they want to ask, put up your hand and uh, we'll uh, do that. Let, well, let me start with, I have two questions. Um, how do you see the universities, the professors, and, and cultu cultural Marxism at work there? Yeah, at the universities, this is the, uh, this is the name of the game. And then that's why you'll see so many university professors um, uh, crying out. Like, like for instance, uh, this... Uh, this recent man that was seemed to be killed unjustly, seemed to be murdered um, by police officers. Uh, because he's a black victim, they, the media wants to turn it into white versus black, and this is an example of racism. When the statistics show um, that black and Hispanic police officers are more likely to shoot black perpetrators, and most police officers, you know, abide by the rules. They're not out there shooting people. But they bring on university professors to turn it into 
uh, critical race theory and to bring that in. Uh, University of Washington, I remember watching a video where Antifa, little Antifa people dressed in black and wearing black masks were pepper spraying people and they pepper sprayed three um, white Americans wearing ball caps. They weren't MAGA caps or anything. They're t-shirts and blue jeans. They're just regular guys, big, strong looking guys, didn't look like weightlifters or anything. But they pepper sprayed these guys in the face just because they were doing their Antifa demonstration just a block away from University of Washington. It started on the campus and it was going out. And by the way, the professors are all for these protests. And they pepper sprayed the guy, this one guy in the face, and he threw a left hook and knocked down the little Antifa person. And the little Antifa person got up and the, the, the three of them got together and said, why did you do that? Why did you do that? And he said, Be because you pepper sprayed me. And what you see is the clash of two worldviews. I don't know if the guys were Christians. My guess is that they weren't. But they grew up in, uh, in, 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 a, in an America that was still influenced by the Christian worldview where individuals have rights. I was minding my own business. Why did you pepper spray me? You pepper spray me, I knock you out. The Antifa people couldn't understand because they have a totally different worldview. You're white males, so you're oppressors. So when, when I pepper spray you in the face, you either thank me or you just move on and think, well, I deserved it anyway. Okay, but, uh, but on university campuses right now, uh, a lot of times you can't even get uh, philosophy, it's, it's difficult to get philosophy courses and they're usually they're not even required at times, uh, but you have to take a, a course in women's studies or feminist studies uh, or uh, in, uh, courses in critical race theory. But this is this basically it has become the dominant worldview among the universities and what the Frankfurt School, what their goals were, those goals have pretty much been accomplished I'm, I'm actually questioning whether we should even send our kids to, to colleges anymore. If a kid wants to be, uh, get a degree in engineering, believe me, you have so many real courses that deal with real truth, they don't have the time to be forced to take all these politically correct cultural Marxist courses. So if somebody wants to be an engineer, going to college isn't a bad thing. Maybe if they want to be a medical doctor and things of that sort, but believe me, most, uh, most departments right now are so infected with cultural Marxism that um, it produces this type of thing. The Ivy League schools were the first to go. The very few professors at Ivy League schools are still traditional, uh, either Christian or Western, uh, traditional uh, Western culture type thinkers. The, the other, uh, one more question I have. How do you see cultural Marxism at work in politics today? Because obviously you don't see that word used at all. Yeah, they don't, they don't use the, the, the phrase cultural Marxism because that lets the cat out of the bag. Um, the way cultural Marxism is being used today um, would be like if you disagree with a politician on something that they're saying, you almost immediately accuse them of being a, a, a racist. Uh, you accuse them of, uh, if, they're, if they think homosexuality is a sin, but they don't want to beat up or imprison homosexuals, no, you're homophobic. And so basically they, they've taken control uh, of the language. And so it's, it's to the point where, um, okay, former Vice President Biden, to give you an example, he just basically came right out and said, uh, when being interviewed by a black male, if you don't vote for me, you're not black. And so what it is, is systemic, the individual is lost. The systemic racism view of critical race theory means if you're black, it's, it's really crazy. To fight racism, what they call racism, they think all blacks are supposed to think alike and vote party line. And um, whereas the traditional view is that no, blacks, so-called whites, European Americans, uh, Asians, whatever we, we can think on our own. And we shouldn't be forced 
into a box. And, um, and so, but, but we see these views uh, more and more. Uh, what, the only difference we're seeing now is uh, the radical far left views of like uh, the Cortez lady and s some of these other, and the Bernie Sanders and his socialism. Their radical views are not really any different than the, the Clintons and the Obamas. It's just that they're more overt about it. They're more honest about it. Whereas there's been a pragmatic cultural Marxist wing that says, well, we know what we want and we'll try to get it, but try to make it sound like, like for instance, when President Obama got elected, he said he wanted to bring together all Americans. Um, now, uh, the truer view of cultural Marxism, where we want to keep people divided, uh, that's kind of the name of the game at this point. So, But the, the thing is, you know, people would say, Fernandez, you're talking all this political stuff. Stay in your lane. You're a philosopher and a theologian. You're a pastor. But everything I've said today is a religious statement. And this is an alternative religion to try to produce an alternative civilization, kill Western civilization, kill America, and bring about a global state that is an anti-Christian global state. How would you see um, um, arming our kids and grandchildren with the information on what's out there? I mean, I, I know of, uh, you know, Summit Ministries where they teach uh, the world mm -hmm. And uh, that's what I see as one defense for our children, grandchildren, but maybe there's others you know. Yeah, others. Summit Ministries is, is real good, uh, the training of kids. Um, uh, I think if, if your kids are going to go to a secular college or a Christian college that's starting to go politically correct, um, then you need to get them some kind of training so that hopefully they won't throw away their faith. And Summit Ministries does a, does a really good job on there. Um, that's the thing, the two-edged sword is the Internet. Through the Internet, you get all this cultural Marxist garbage. But Facebook, um, Twitter, Instagram, they haven't been able to shut down the traditional side yet. So that sometimes just by surfing the internet, you can find the truth in the midst of the lies. But it's getting harder and harder. But I definitely would um, recommend that kids go to Christian schools that are remaining Christian schools, Christian colleges and stuff. I'm, I'm a big fan of homeschooling and Christian education, kindergarten through 12th grade. But if you're going to send them to college, send them to a Christian school. I know it's going to be more expensive. Um, but uh, these secular schools are just, it, it's basically, it's all about indoctrination. We're getting graduates of Ivy League schools that are no longer capable of critical thinking. All they can do is uh, regurgitate what their cultural Marxist professors fill their heads with. And when you disagree with them, they laugh and think you're pre-scientific, you're a Neanderthal, um, or, or they just call you names because that's what they're trained to do. And uh, so. Okay, well, thank you, Phil, for doing that for us. And uh, we'll, uh, people online, and uh, look at the recording later on. Uh, we will pray that they benefit from that as well. So let's give Phil another hand for that. And... Thank you very much. And I have just one more slide to show uh, to wrap up this evening. Uh, next month, we have a Dr. Jerry Bergman coming. This the, will be the first time that he's speaking at our forum. Now, he's, I said he's coming, but actually he's going to be uh, on a Zoom program, and we'll network him in. And then we will, of course, uh, still um, live stream it and uh, record it after it. Uh, Jerry is kind of a, a unique individual. He is, uh, you'll see, he's got nine advanced degrees. Uh, most of them are in uh, religion, biology, philosophy, and he brings all that together and defends the, uh, the Christian faith. He 
has an interesting history. He used to be a very devout evolutionist. And uh, when he was challenged and came to look at the details himself, he uh, flipped and uh, is now a very dedicated Christian and a Christian creationist. So we'll look forward to having him uh, speak here uh, next month. So uh, for those of you that uh, uh, I, I know we're not uh, online each th and that see this recording later on, I want to remind you, if you want to be informed of future events, just uh, subscribe to our, our mailing list uh, online. And there is a lot of information available online, not just about the Apologetics Forum ministry, but also about other uh, lectures and other creation ministries, apologetics ministries as well. So let me just close in a word of prayer, and then we'll be uh, dismissed. Father, we thank you for this time, and we thank you for the knowledge that uh, Phil brings to bear on us to warn us about the, the battle out there the battle that we face, the battle that our children and grandchildren face as well. And uh, we just pray that the uh, information that Phil has shared with us will go forth, that people will watch this, benefit from it, and share it with others. And we just thank you for Phil's ministry. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.